Thank you very much, and thank you all. Um, so this is a topic I've talked about a lot, the broader topic, but the actual talk on data is talk I've never given, so I don't have a sense of how long this is going to take. So um, ask a lot of questions. We'll see how we get through. Um, but when I uh, first, oh, before I move to talk, I want to say this is joint work with my PhD student, um, Izu Ozel. This is actually a, a kind of a side project, something we needed to do for her project, but I thought it was really interesting and fits well with the theme. But this is um, a very long uh, broader project with the Evanston Public Schools. And so a lot of my colleagues at Northwestern in engineering and education and social policy, uh, our school district partners, and our generous funders. So I want to thank all of them. Um, but when I was looking at the scope of the workshop and thought about, well, what would be interesting, what I think might be, I hope, is of interest to this, this group, I thought about it, and, and Marco, you had that. There was a bunch of things in your talk that set my top off, talk off, so thank you. Um, that mobility is an end to a mean. Means to an end, sorry, and means to an end. And that's my talk today is going to be about access to education um, and equitable access to education and this um, thought of historic injustices and kind of how that plays out in the decisions that we make, which I probably um, teased a little bit in some of my comments during Marco's talk. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. I also, you know, there's been a lot of talk about data, and um, it was really great to have the talk this morning about um, mobility data justice. And so I want to talk specifically about data. So the question that, um, as I said, that Izu had as kind of a side project in her thesis, which ended up becoming a full paper on its own, is in modeling equitable access to education, how do we develop context-rich data sets that reflect historic injustices when student data are protected under federal law? So we want to have data sets that are meaningful, but we're also dealing with a setting in which the data cannot be widely shared because it is protected under um, federal law. Now, this talk is going to be very much focused on the US, but we can, many of the um, takeaways will apply more broadly. So on that note, um, and also for Marco, also going back in history as well, um, the operations research community has been working on modeling equitable access to schools going back decades. So 1954, this is my little history uh, lesson, 1954 was the US Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education, that said that separate and but unequal, <laughs> separate education facilities are inherently equal. So this idea that you could have a school for white children and a school for black children was, went against the Constitution of the United States. That was 1954. All these other cases came forward. We're saying, well, OK, you don't just say that you can't have schools separated by race, but actually there need to be proactive um, initiatives in place. And so that's where transportation comes in. So transportation then became a mechanism to uh, desegregate schools. What I think is interesting is, and I'll talk about this in the talk today, is both the role that it played in terms of desegregating schools, but also leading to inequality or inequity in terms of how students access the schools they attend. So these are just some papers from the literature that give you a sense of kind of that work around the time, right? So you can see these titles, and I specifically put the titles and not just the authors, because I think in some ways that's more meaningful, because you see both an application um, in terms of school desegregation and racial balance, but you also see a modeling approach. So you can kind of see how the research community came together and said, oh, wait, we think that we might have some ideas here. And then there also was some ensuing work. Um, so the papers up top are more on school districting. So school districting is if you think about, um, and maybe I'll go back to this picture of Evanston for a minute, that I have all of these geographic units and students in these units, and I need to assign them to schools in ways to um, balance schools. And I'll talk about those units in a minute. So that's kind of what these early papers were, were looking at. And then papers after that said, well, there's also the issue of transportation. And how do we think about um, how school, children are getting to their schools? 
So this is the school districting problem. So this is um, Evanston, Illinois, where Northwestern is. You'll see this map a lot. And then I just learned that we have a product of Evanston Public Schools here today. So um, any questions about Evanston Public Schools, you can ask Raphael. That's great. And you went to Orrington, right? Right up here? I, I would have technically went to Baker, sorry. Oh. But Evanston Township High School, so it's all OK. OK. <laughs> Hadn't discussed that. Would have been good. Sorry. <laughs> My kids went to Baker for preschool. It's great. Um, OK, so this is, this is Northwestern. For those of you who've been here, this is Chicago. This is Lake Michigan. Um, and so the school districting problem is saying that we're going to draw these attendance boundaries. And the way mathematical models are built to draw these boundaries, again, is if you think about all of these different geographic units, you're assigning them to a school to essentially create the boundary. Right. Now, back in 1960, when these models start to be were, were first coming about, there was no way that you could optimize at this scale. There, you could not have operation or optimization models that could solve something that small. You know, right now we can run these models on our personal computer. Back then, it really was, I'm going to rent time on the IBM machine and solve this. And so actually, when I show these papers some, in different versions of the talk, I actually talk specifically about whether the academics were working with the school district or the families, because that impacted the budget and whether what size model they could run because of these issues. So, so back then, two big things. One, you were not solving it at the city block level. You were looking at very large residential tracts. And two, you were looking at continuous variables. So, Ideally, you would say, if students live in this block, they go to the school. But back then, it was really hard to solve with these binary variables. And so they instead were continuous variables. Um, Clark and Circus is probably um, referred to as the kernel problem, the first paper that looked at these capacity feasible assignments of students to schools. And Marco, again, your talk was so great. So you showed the curves. Are there markers here? There's not markers here. Um, so Marco was showing the curve in equity, um, looking at it was cumulative. Yeah, right here. I hate chalk. OK, but I will do it. I Sorry. hate chalk so much. I'm like, I don't know what kind of professor hates chalk. But you had something community, uh, cumulative population on the side, and then at, uh, um, accessibility. Yeah, so similar um, charts were used back. Uh, in these models in the Clark and Circus models, where on the x-axis would be the cumulative uh, black students in a community, and this would be cumulative white students. And so racial equity at the time, or, or racial um, diversity in the schools, would be this 45 degree angle. So meaning that if you looked at the, so say, you know, what we're here in Westwood Village, what, is that where we are? If it's 40% uh, black, that any school in the district, you would look at that school and the population should be 40%. That's the 45 degree line. This is racial segregation. And then this is school segregation as a result of racial segregation. So if you say, OK, we're just going to assign students to schools based on where they live, well, if where they live is also segregated because of redlining and where um, people were allowed to live, then you would end up with a solution that looked like that. So now you've got these. Um, optimization models that try to redistribute students to reach some balance. So you should imagine that this is going to be a little bit <laughs> challenging and everything that comes with that. Um, so one other point that I want to make is that this focus on equity is not new in our community. So this is a paper from 1974. And this paper looked at some of the models and looked at how do our assumptions about the geographic distribution of students lead to inequitable solutions? So this is not a real s school district, but it's not that far off in terms of what could be solved in the problems uh, in the day. So this was in the paper. They looked at this simplified example to make their point. And so this was a um, school district that was divided into four geographic regions, tracks uh, A, B, C, and D, with three schools. So you can see there's three schools. Each school has the same capacity. And they also looked at, and again, this was just an extreme example, but again, not terribly off um, from the time. So you can see that track D is 100% white students. Um, 
Track B has 15% black, um, C is 30%, and A is 100%. So the question is, if you solve a model where you're trying to get to the 45 degree line, what's going to happen? Now on top of that, think about the fact, again, I said they were solving really large, they had to make the units really large and to be able to solve them, so the problems they solved were really small. And so what happens if you assume, again, this is getting to this question about the assumptions that we make in our models. It's not we were talking about objective functions and the impact on equity. Sometimes it's even just the underlying assumptions of, on the data. So if you assume that the students are uniformly distributed in track B, so right, track B is 15% black, and so a model that assumes that any random spot in this large track has students that are 15% black, then in order to get to this line up here, some students are gonna go to this school and some students are gonna go to that school. Now, if you actually look at that, you can see this is inherently unequal, right? So what will happen is the student, by assuming that this, so they would say distance is by the centroid of track B, so school three doesn't look so bad and school two looks good. Whereas for these students, they're going incredibly far distance to go. And so this is, um, again, another quote from this paper that is the basis of this multi-year research project, that in reality, it appears that most desegregation has come about by redrawing school boundaries, one-way volunteering busing, open enrollment, and other devices, which in general have placed the burden of being bused on black students. So this is 1964, sorry, 1974. It is now almost 50 years later. So what happened in Evanston? So as I said, this, this is an older map of Evanston. Um, you would still go to Orrington, though, back then. Uh, and so in Evanston, this is what is uh, known as the Fifth Ward, where Foster School was. So Evanston, this is Lake Michigan. So really, really nice big homes here. Um, and this is, this is the channel. This is the railroad. So there's these physical barriers that create the Fifth Ward. And this is historically where African-American families who uh, worked in the homes on the lake lived. And so Foster School was the school that served the Fifth Ward. So what happened in 1966 is that, and this is, you know, the Stinson and Thompson paper talked about non-voluntary one-way busing. Oftentimes it was, or voluntary, it was not voluntary. So in Evanston it was not voluntary and the Foster School was closed. And so students who went to Foster were then bused. You might look at, oh look, they got all these tiny little school districts. No. If you can read here, which Amanda, even sitting up here, you probably can't read it. Um, these are all of the schools to which students are bused. So what they did is they took a community school in which all of these kids went to the same school and they sent them to other schools. So um, I'm going to get back to that in one minute. Remind me, say, Karen, you were going to say something, but then you didn't, if I don't. Um, this is from a book about the um, desegregation of schools in Evanston. And it's a really good quote in the book that talks about the use of technology gave this guise of objectivity that really didn't exist. Um, so that is how they came up with a solution. So in 2001, that is still the case. So um, this is the Fifth Ward. Willard is up here. So there's still not a school in the Fifth Ward, and the students in the Fifth Ward go to, um, they're, if you look at here, they're assigned to five schools. If you actually look at the data, the students go to every school. Because once you don't have a neighborhood school and you're going on a bus, what difference does it make what school you go to? Um, so in 2001, there was this call to action that all students have the right to a local area school, high quality education, high quality programs, and high quality teachers that are proximate to their homes and neighborhoods. So this idea that a solution in which we create diverse schools by busing students out of the fifth ward is not equitable. And so at the time, a, com a committee was formed across Evanston. Uh, this is Sarita Smith, who led the committee. She's amazing. She's been a great partner to work with in all of this. And she formed this committee. And I, my research group was brought in to do the modeling. Um, but what was really neat is that it was also partnered with members of the community. And so um, 
it made me think in the talk this morning about procedural. Like a lot of what we did and we focused on building our model was how do we de develop a model that all the community members felt like they were developing with us. Right? How do we think about defining decision variables in a way that is accessible? And we would meet every two weeks for a period of six months and say, OK, here's the solutions we came up with. Here's how the model, here's what the objective function is. Here's what the constraints are. And then the committee would say, no, that's not good. That's a, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. Um, and this is the point I was saying that um, I was going to give you one quote. So one of the gentlemen on the committee went to foster school at the time that it was closed. And he would talk about, you know, the, You'll see, you'll hear people use the terms integration and desegregation interchangeably. And he'll say, this is integration and this is desegregation. And that's what it felt like when you went to foster school, that all of a sudden all the kids from foster school were just sent to schools across the district. So in, 2000, in 2021, we started working on this project. And normally when I present the talk, this sorry, is Sorry, about the yep. solution that they did in 1966. Yep. Would there have been an obvious alternative that would have been better? Like, because um, you needed yeah. in the short run yep. to come up with something. Yep. And of course, the situation was not perfect. Yep. You cannot redesign yep. everything and so yep. on, right? Yep. So, so what Berkeley did is two-way busing. Okay. So, and it's a little bit harder in Evanston because it was so concentrated at the right. time. Yeah. Um, but but two-way busing says, we're not going to close the school necessarily in the, in the black neighborhoods. We're going to close some schools, possibly. Right. But instead of, so students, um, typically they're looking at kindergarten through sixth grade. And so two-way busing says that from kindergarten to third grade, you're going to go to one school. And then from fourth grade to sixth grade, you go to another school. And so that way, and they're pairing. So that way, you'd say that, um, you know, for it, Every student for half of the time has a neighborhood school, and every time, every student for half the time is taking a bus. I see. It's a so little. It's not tricky. that this school deserved to be closed uh, because it was just the worst school, and it should have been closed or something. So one could have done something else in that situation. Yeah. It yeah. Was just it didn't cross people's mind that one yeah. should do something. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it I mean, again, like I can talk about this a lot. There's a lot in the book that's really interesting. The impact of school lunches at the time there were no um, cafeterias. Now, partly for the women in the room, the reason there were no cafeterias is because if there's no cafeterias, the women have to stay home and be there when their kids come home for lunch. So when your kid has a gymateria at your school, think about that's also to keep the women down. Um, so then it becomes a problem because not only are these kids going to other schools, they're going to schools where all of a sudden at the lunch table, everyone else is going. They didn't even have a lunch table. So, um, but having said that, it is a little, Berkeley, um, because if there were more schools to do this pairing, it would be a little bit harder there. Um, certainly today, it, it, we shouldn't be here in 2021, right? So in the years that, so, and I'll show some um, images later in the talk that'll show the um, racial distribution of students in Evanston, much more diversity here and still a lot of diversity in the middle. So it is possible now. Whereas in 1966, you couldn't do two-way busing, 100% in the last 30 years, yeah, you could have done two of us. You could have started this earlier than 20 Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, it was started earlier. Again, another side talk. Right. There was a referendum that didn't pass um, about 10 years, 13 years ago. And then um, it did in 2020. Now, good, good question. Good. And keep the questions coming. Like I said, I have no idea how long this talk is going to be. So we'll cover what we can. Um, so, because normally I give this talk. Normally on this topic, I'm going to show you this, but don't worry, I'm not. Um, this is what we did. And what we did is we had this idea of coming up with this, and this is, I zoom my PhD student, this is 100% her idea, is this composite variable formulation. So what is a composite variable? Think about vehicle routing. It's either the arc-based formulation, where my decision variables are all the arcs that the vehicle travels, or it's the route. And that's a composite variable because it has it's composed of all of the arcs. So a composite variable formulation for school is for if a student lives in a block, what are all the possible schools that student could go to? So it's elementary school, middle school, high school, but it's also English language learning programs. If they go to a different school for English language learning, if they go to a selective enrollment school. So that way, and again, this is Berkeley does a lot of these like um, area models where you have just a selection of schools. So this is what Azu did. And normally, this is the talk, like I said, that I give, um, which was great because members of the committee who are not engineers by practice would talk about streams. I'm talking like, oh, well, what if we use this stream or that stream? And so it was a great way for us to take this um, very complex optimization problem and 
distill it down to, now that this is not actually the version I showed in the committee, but it's not that far off in terms of what we did. Then came the question of benchmarking, right? So Izu is still getting her PhD in operations research and not in um, education and social policy. So the question is, how does this model compare to models from the literature? And in terms of size of Evanston and the size of the model that we solved, it's comparable to um, what are some of like the leading papers on school um, districting models. But by federal law, they're all protected, just like our data is. Even I, I'll show you again some images to show you the level at which we got the data. We're very fortunate at Northwestern that we have a data sharing agreement with Chicago Public Schools and Evanston Public Schools. And it's amazing as a researcher because I can basically put a, together a proposal, say this is what I want to do, and they'll tell me at what level I can have the data and we'll process it. It's great, but I can't give it to any of you. And just like I can't give it to any of you, none of these authors can give us their data either. So then we were like, okay, well, let's create some mock data. And the student worked on this. I think when I went to Cornell, this was like right where we were. We're like, oh, cool, we're going to create these data. And then, and then I see sat down to do it. And she's like, well, this is crazy. Because you come up with these data sets that don't look anything like reality, right? You know, we kind of thought about, okay, let's distribute the population. And then we'll put the school in the center of the population. But I just told you the schools were not in the center of the population unless that population was white. And so we're like, well, we have to scrap that idea. Because otherwise, we're, we're comparing our models on data sets that are very different from the problems. And in districting problems, the distribution of the students matter, right? It's kind of like, think of it as like a packing problem, right? And if you assume they're uniformly distributed, you're taking tiny little units and packing them in. That's pretty easy, right? That's kind of as easy as it gets. Now, what if instead you had a distribution, like Marco's distribution, where you know you have the population is uniform across the line, but the job opportunities aren't. And that's the same thing that we have. But in fact, the population distribution is also not uniform across. And then we have all of these schools up north. Sorry, why could you not do that? It sounds like a cool project, like design a principled mathematical model yeah. that generates the last 100 years yeah. of urban situations in the United States, incorporating red zoning and all the th red redlining and all the things that were there in a principled fashion yeah. that would generate these data. Why is that not possible? That's what we did, but we didn't do it this way. So this way, it's just completely random. Right. Right. So, yeah. so, so it didn't reproduce the correct data, but it should be doable if it one is. takes the right things into account to, to have an automatic generation of these data. That's my whole talk. Oh, that's your talk. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We cannot go that route. Okay. We're gonna do uh, this one. Uh, okay. 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 <laughs> okay. So that's it. I'm gonna go now. I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> this is so much more fun than I thought it would be. Um, so that is what we're gonna do. Awesome. Okay. So. And Marco, again, I'm just going to, just between your comments and Marco's talk, I'm really done. But you have the question from Jose about politics and like kind of what can engineers do when everything's so political? This slide. Of everything we did, and I've been working with the Evanston schools now for six, seven, eight years. This is a slide that some undergraduates, this visual, it is the most powerful slide I've ever had students put together. Because what this shows you, without identifying where the students live, so these are all the blocks of Evanston. And then with each block, we uniformly just made a bunch of dots to represent every student in that block. And then the color of the student is along the um, race and ethnicity categories that uh, is reported to the state of Illinois. So this shows two things. One, it shows that we are not, that we are very segregated in terms of where students live. Now you, sh you show that against where the schools are, right? Here's where all the students are. Here's where all the schools are. And at the time, and so in 2021, when this um, call for a new school came in, there was a lot of backlash. Like, if you do this, our schools are going to be segregated again. And this slide gives the community, like, well, we have to wrestle with that. If our housing is segregated, Either our schools are going to be segregated, or we're going to require students of color to go on the bus. And I've had undergraduates in my classes do the analysis. Um, the biggest factor, or one of the biggest factors in determining whether or not you take a bus to school is your race and ethnicity. 
And we have to say, Evanston kind of claims it's a very diverse, progressive community. Are we okay with that? Right? I'm talking a lot about school desegregation from the 60s. There's also um, uh, a lot of our students, um, our Latinx students are involved in two-way two immersion as their English language learning program, which is only at a subset of schools. And the students travel very far to get to their school because in two-way immersion, you want to balance the classes. So you want it to be half English dominant and half Spanish dominant. So as engineers in the room, you should know it's really hard to hit small numbers. So what ends up happening is a student is going to enroll in TWI and they say, we don't have any more space here, so you're going to go to a school much further away. And so this stream idea that Izu came up, part of that is you know, this value within the community that we can't do that. That what would happen is the English language learning programs run until fifth grade. And then when you go to middle school at, at sixth grade, kids have a choice to make. Do I stay with the kids I've been going to school with all this time, or do I go to school with my neighbors, which is really close? And so the idea is how do we take this, this value within the community that we no longer wanted that to be feasible and put that into the model? So that is our model. The other thing that this, this figure shows is not only, and you know, people talk a lot about, okay, and even that quote from the 60s, that students were bused from black neighborhoods to diversify schools. The other thing that they were, that happened as a result of busing students is you could justify keeping schools open, right? So if you look on the north side of Evanston, there's not a lot of students. And there are four elementary schools. And so, and I can tell you, we, I live up here, my kids could walk to three different schools. And so it also showed that students were not only adding diversity, they were just adding volume to justify schools being open. So it was a really, it's a really impactful visual to say like, what are we comfortable with and how do we move forward? If there aren't, there's no perfect solution to all of, any of these problems, so how do we think about that? So this is Evanston. And then the question is, okay, how do we start to create data sets that reflect this reality without the fact that I can't give you this data? Even by, you know, now at this point, you can't actually see where the students live. I still can't share this data with you. This is very much protected data. Um, I will say as a side note, in general, even away from the equity issue, using real school data matters. So this is a, a work that I did with um, a former PhD student and my colleague Sunil Chopra on um, school bus scheduling. And um, at that point, we had access to the Evanston data. We also partner with Denver Public Schools. So we had both a moderate sized school district and a very large school district. But when it came to um, coming up with the computational studies and the benchmarking, we did our two districts. And then we could make this um, publicly available, but it never, I was never satisfied with it. it especially because one of the things that um, Leeway wanted to look at was robustness to changes over time. And changes over time in school districts have a certain rhythm to them. It's not like each year it's, oh, who's going to show up for school this year, right? You kind of know the first graders are going to become second graders. The second graders are going to become third graders. So even then, we were kind of getting to the point where like, we really want to have benchmarks to work on these problems, that there is, there's a lot in this data that should be captured that maybe isn't. So there is. What, what, what part of the data cannot be shared? Uh, where students live and where they go to school, <coughs> and their race and ethnicity. Because you can get race by, from census. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah, so that can be shared. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's basically what is now... The, how these data sets are being created. Exactly that. So census can give you race and ethnicity. It can give you income level. So you can um, start to look at free and reduced lunch, um, which is an important part of this work, is the students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. You can also get um, population under 18. Um, what you don't know is where those kids go to school. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And so then from the national, from part of the DOE, DOE within Department of Education in the United States, there's the National Center for Educational Statistics, which can give you all the information about the schools in your school district. So how many elementary schools, what grades do they serve, um, if there's something like English language learning services, where are they hosted. And so there's been some work um, in this area. And so this is what we did. Right, so what we did is we looked at, okay, we've got census uh, blocks and census block groups, which gives us data on um, demographic data about the population uh, within a school district. And then we also have um, district data. And so in both cases, we have 
um, both counts, but we also have some really good geocoded data. So we have the shape files on all the census blocks, we have shape files on um, school districts and all of that. So our plan now is to merge these two. So this is kind of how we want to start moving towards coming up with a benchmark of test cases that reflect the reality of school districts. So a couple of assumptions in order to do that. Um, so some data are available at the block level, some are available at the block group level. Sometimes the data at the block level is not complete, and so it's better to use the block group level. So the first um, assumption is that if we are, whenever we need to use block group level, we can just assume that that is uniformly distributed within the, that all the blocks within that block group are the same, because you have to at some point distribute. Um, then the other big assumption, assumption number two, is that the geographic distribution of students in the district is the same as geographic distribution of school-aged children. For some districts, this is a fair assumption. Others, where private schools or parochial, school, parochial schools represent a large percentage of enrollment, it is less true because it's not enrollment in private school is not uniformly distributed throughout the district, right? So if your district says there are 30,000 kids under 18 and your district enrollment is 20,000, that 10,000 going to private school is probably not uniformly distributed. So that is, I would say, one limitation of um, this data set. It doesn't reflect that aspect. Uh, so then the, other, the next thing is you, you could then use these census block groups as your decision-making unit. So um, at the core of um, school districting models, you need some geographic unit to assign students. For transportation, you're going to need actual student locations. And you can do something like what we did with that visual where we assigned you know, little dots within a block. Um, but what Izu wanted to do with this fishnet is that, again, and, and I didn't maybe say this, but we say this like a thousand times in our paper. The purpose of this data set is to compare models. It is not to go in and tell districts how to design their district. You know, otherwise our whole first paper would be garbage, right? Our whole first paper is basically that you need to work in partnership with districts, right? If you are going to help them make their decisions about how to do school transportation or, or districting, all of that needs to be a community-engaged endeavor not a randomly generated data, even if it's using good census data. The purpose of this data set is that for best practices, so we, we heard about um, the Dutch railway, which there were some debate about, but, but it's a benchmark, right? And so as an academic field, we need benchmarks, right? At the end of the day, this is still, we still want to know that the model that we made, does is this a good model? That's what we do. And that's what this data is for. What this data is for is, assistant professors who want to start working in this area but don't have a connection, don't have a Northwestern data sharing agreement and all of that. So with that very, very strong caveat, this is about evaluating optimization models and solution approaches. So this fishnet grid is really neat because it allows you to think about what makes these models hard is how many cells how many units of decision making. And so with the fishnet grid, you can make them kind of bigger or smaller. So you can think about um, the instances. So it really um, is nice in that respect. This is the second bullet point. The first bullet point, one of the big challenges in, in Evanston, and this is true in the Caro paper as well, geograph geography is not squares. <laughs> and so when you're doing things like um, adjacency matrices or you have contiguity constraints, so making sure that you're um, Right, so the way that you draw these lines is not you're drawing lines, you're coloring the circles or the squares to make your decisions. And so you want them to be contiguous. And so you need a way to model contiguity constraints and abnormal geography makes it so, so hard. So at least, you know, in this way, you can play around with that a little bit. Okay, so how do we do that? So we've got the census data. And the census data kind of, you can think about it as like a heat map for whatever attributes you want to look at, right? So you can look over your district and it can tell you the distribution of students by race, by English language learning, by free and reduced lunch. But we, what we want is actual numbers, right? And in order to use these models, the input to the models are integers. And so, you know, it could be really simple to just do an expectation and round, but that is 
really hard to do, right? If you, it really gives you unsatisfactory integer counts. How you round could really change, because we're dealing with small numbers in each of these cells. So that didn't work really well. So um, what we did is we came up with this function distribute, which will tell you the student count in any cell by attribute. So an attribute could be race and ethnicity. It could be free and reduced lunch status. It could be English language learning status. And so this function takes as input the total enrollment. So this is data that we got from um, the Department of Education. So it's the number of students, the number of students by race, the number of students by English language learning. Um, with the probabilities, so this is from the census. So now we have kind of a way to, it's like kind of your attractor, right? So how, as you look to distribute this total enrollment, how are they drawn to different cells? within the fishnet. And then this is the upper bound by attribute. So the way that we do it sequentially is we don't know the intersection. We don't know that a student is in second grade, English language learner, African American, right? That isn't, so we need to create that. And so in order to do that, you need a way to make sure that actually the same, every time, for every attribute, the total number of students in the cell is the same. And so that's what we use. So a couple of assumptions to do that. Um, so you have to take the census block data and put it into the fishnet grid um, and put it into this district itself. And so we basically, these two um, assumptions boil down to everything is proportional to geography. And if this, you know, because our cells are so small, I think that it's a pre these are pretty reasonable assumptions. I would say the hardest one so far is that uh, the one about enrollment within the district. So this is the distribute function, and um, these are the terms that I introduced before. And basically, it just iterates through um, attributes and cells. And you, if you think about like every cell has a probability, you know how probable it is, and that's kind of how big your window is for a random number to fall in that number, right? So that's kind of how we do it. And so that way, we're assigning students um, to all the cells by all the different attributes, and that gives us the distribution of students. So um, this is the original data. So this is Evanston, where the schools are. And this is a, a heat map of enrollment. And this is our data approximation. So um, it does pretty well. You know, just kind of visualizing, we're pretty happy in terms of our ability to capture the dynamics of where students live and where the schools are located. Um, but again, our question really was about comparing the two formulations. Now, I'm not going to show you a comprehensive analysis of the two formulations. That's not the purpose of today's talk. You can do that another time. Um, but I don't really think that necessarily fits with the theme today. Well, the theme today is, would we come to wrong decisions about models if we had wrong assumptions about our underlying data? So. Um, we're going to refer to them then just as formulation one and formulation two. I don't want to spend too much time talking about the differences of the formulation. What I want to show you is some kind of common assumptions. So one other thing that um, I do and I did for this paper is we went through the literature and said, like, well, what do people do, right? Given that either there's a lot of papers like ours that uses um, data through data sharing agreements that's not uh, that you can't share. There's some that do kind of a uniform distribution. You know, for those of us who have ever worked on the traveling salesman problem or the VRP, right? There's uniform, random. There's clustered. So you can think about like there's a uniform distribution. There's also school-centered. So if you know where the schools are and you then just um, distribute students by proximity to the school, which is a common assumption in the literature. Well, in the literature, they kind of do it in the reverse, where they distribute students and then put a school in the middle. So that's uh, school-centered, which is kind of the, our original idea. And then census-based is the work that we did. Um, I also want to note that the scales are different, right? This is 50 for some really dense um, population. This is 40, and this is 18. And again, this matters when you're evaluating optimization models that are trying to kind of pack cells into um, a bigger unit. So to keep the focus on um, the impact of distribution, this is formulation one, this is formulation two. So um, I just spent a lot of time trying to find districts that would just be, were very different. 
So we looked at different regions of the United States, west, south, midwest, northeast, and west. Um, we looked at the size of the district, so you can see um, how big the cities are, uh, how many schools are in the district are very different. We also wanted to look at districts that have, and that doesn't come through in this part, but different mix of schools. Do they have some um, you know, K through five schools, K through eight schools, selective enrollment schools, things like that. And then for each of um, the districts, we came up, we did five uh, instances. So there's a, random, there's a random element to all of these, these distribution. And so we wanted to kind of see how um, they differ. The most important thing is to look at the fact that, yes, as we suspected, geographic distribution impacts the decisions that you make. Right, and so um, the instances with the school-centered are often um, solved the fastest, right? Because they're kind of solve the problem for you, right? You're basically solving a problem like, hey, draw boundaries around a school, and we place the school around where the students are. So those were shockingly not that hard. Um, it is true that in some cases, and I should say that anything in um, parentheses is just the optimality gap after um, an hour. I think we did an hour. The other interesting thing, there are some times where the uniform does not solve as quickly as we would have expected. And I think part of that is they can also be much larger instances. So in the census block, the census-based approach, if you have a river, if you have a shopping mall, you know, you might have large parts of a city that have no students. And so if there's no census counts in those blocks, there's going to be no students. In the uniform, and to some extent the school-based, you will have students. So you can see that in some cases the difference is not very large. And again, this is we wanted to pick um, school districts that were very different in their distribution um, and their geography. But for some, it's very different. So instance five and instance three, you can see that the uniform has far more cells, so a lot more decision variables to work with than um, the census-based. Right. So this, this is an upper bound because, again, it could vary a little bit based on the probabilities. Right. The census doesn't say there are this many students in the cell. It just tells you what's the probability. So. Um, so this is kind of our, our takeaway from school districting is to be able to provide researchers and, and all of this data um, is available online with ways to create these benchmark data sets that if you have a new way to solve the school districting problem like we do, you now have data sets to test different models on. Um, if you think, oh, this actually sounds, maybe you're in the audience today, you're like, this sounds like something cool I want to work on. Now you know how to get data to do that. Um, the other thing we wanted to look at was, OK, well, what about um, school bus transportation? So similar to the way that we did um, that picture that showed Evanston students across, at this point, we show them by grade. For school transportation, grade is really important. Um, and we just randomly, you know, within the blocks, distribute the students. So then we can have um, information about where the students live, so we can determine things like um, in the school bus a school bus problem, where are the bus stops? How do we route the buses? You can look at, based on where the schools are, is it walkable, or um, where the students take the bus. So this is kind of the next part, um, uh, next use of the data. So um, we did pretty well on time. Uh, I do want to end again on this note of what this data can do and what it can't. I don't want the impression to be at all that you have this data set, so now go tell school districts how to do their job. I think that you know, it gives you a chance to look at your models, think about the work that you're doing, and then go to school districts and say, hey, let's work on this. Um, and then, I, honey, did you do this when you, I cannot end a presentation without the slide. I don't know if you did this when you were editor, but it's really great work today. I really like this work. And so I'm also going to put on my hat as editor of transportation science and say this is something that we are very passionate about. So the journal, um, three years ago, we started having areas. And actually, you've got two of your area editors here in the room. Um, so we now have four different areas of the journal. And one area of the journal is emerging across cutting topics. <laughs> Just forget the name of that area. But the idea of this area is really to think about transportation more broadly and also to be able to say to our reviewers, hey, this is a different, this is not logistics and routing. I do not want a paper that says, here's a model, here's the computational, which is literally the talk I just gave, but that's okay. Um, but what we want is we want the reviewers to think about the paper differently and having this other area of the journal says, this is separate. 
you know, Marco and Yafang can talk to you about traffic network and demand analysis. We've got modes and industry. We've got logistics and routing. And the reviewers for those areas kind of have a sense of what we're looking for. Emerging and cross-cutting topic areas, we, we want things that are a little bit out there. Um, so please send us stuff. I would say that we had our, our three-year, um, like, how are we doing three years in, uh, me and the area editors? And I would say one of the things is we don't think we take enough risks. And that was kind of a, a takeaway. So we want to take more risks. Send us, I mean, send us your really good work. Don't be like, this is really risky because it may not be very good. Um, but, you know, send us interesting work. So that, that's all I have. Okay, thank you very much.